Hey there, Alex here. After the well-received OnePlus 3 last year, I had really high hopes for what OnePlus would release this year. So putting aside the hype, the marketing and broken promises, let's just take a look at the phone itself, the OnePlus 5. From the design, it's not hard to see where OnePlus got its inspiration from. I actually do kind of like it, but it's just a bit boring. You get to choose any colour you want, as long as it's black. I do like the way it tapers towards the edges and curves into the side. It's a nice design touch and makes the phone feel smaller than it really is. On the side, the alert slider is still here and still a really useful feature to have around to quickly silence the phone. Turn the phone around and you get the same 5.5 inch Full HD screen that you get on the OnePlus 3T. I don't really mind the resolution that much since it's still a decent looking panel. Outdoor visibility could be a bit better though. This is a minor nitpick from me, but under direct lighting, the panel looks a bit more greyish. So in those situations, the blacks actually doesn't look as deep as other AMOLED panels I've seen. I've seen reports on the jello effect while scrolling as well. And if I try to look for it, I can definitely see a bit of that, but in day-to-day -day usage, it's not a big deal to me. Below the display, you get one of the fastest fingerprint sensors around, but what I actually like more about the phone is actually the customizations for the navigation buttons. I can choose to use on-screen buttons or capacitive buttons, I can swap the order if I want to, I can even customize my own shortcuts for a double tap or a long press for each of the capacitive buttons. So for example, I can set a long press of the home button to turn off the screen. This flexibility is part of why Oxygen OS is still one of my favorite flavors of Android. It's basically Android on steroids. On the surface, it's a very lean, very stock version of Android. You even get the same swipe up app drawer as on the Google Pixel, but hidden around the phone are some very useful features. I can lift the phone to check my notifications, or I can just use a double tap. I can draw letters when the screen is off to activate certain features or launch an app. I can swipe down anywhere on the home screen to get to notifications. I can change to a dark mode and change how some UI elements look. There are a few new features worth mentioning too. A gaming do not disturb mode which lets me play my games in peace, the ability to take a long screenshot which is handy and a new reading mode to save my eyeballs from burning. This new reading mode is actually pretty interesting. It can even adjust the color temperature of the screen to suit the lighting I'm in. I can even set default apps to trigger this mode. Sometimes I can spend hours reading on my phone, so this is really useful for me. The performance and fluidity of the interface is excellent as well, and is one of the fastest Android phones around. This excellent performance probably isn't surprising when you look at the specifications of the phone. You get the latest Snapdragon 835 chipset with either 6GB of RAM and 64GB of storage or 8GB of RAM and 128GB of storage. So as expected, app launches quickly, games runs really smoothly and I can switch between tons of apps without needing to reload them. Even though this is the 6GB version, the experience is still excellent. With a 3300mAh battery, it's just a little bit smaller than the OnePlus 3T, but with the more power efficient chipset and RAM, battery life is pretty good too. A day of use for me is easily achievable, and desk charging is the best fast charge solution I've used. It's fast and doesn't heat up the phone as much. The only downside is that it requires proprietary accessories for the fast charging to work. The focus for OnePlus this time round is the new dual camera setup, clearly inspired by the iPhone 7 Plus. You get a 16 megapixel main shooter with f1.7 aperture and a secondary telephoto camera with 20 megapixel at f2.6 aperture. So you get the same portrait mode background blur effect, which works well enough. It's fun to play around with once in a while, but I find a wide angle camera more useful. The other use would be just for zooming in. While it says 2 times magnification, the camera actually switches at 1.6, the rest is just digital enhancements. This second camera doesn't activate in low light, so it's pretty much just digital zoom when you punch in, which is the same thing that the iPhone 7 Plus is doing. Overall image quality is pretty decent, and the phone meters the exposure reliably. Some manufacturers like to go for a higher exposure, which I'm not a huge fan of. Color reproduction is a bit on the saturated side, but generally pleasing to look at. The only thing that bugs me a little is the shift in color between both cameras. Auto HDR Mux works really well too at brightening the shadows while keeping the highlights in check. 
When you start to zoom in a little though, it is easy to see OnePlus heavy handed image processing and noise reduction. Even in good lighting, you can see some lost of details, making it look a bit more like a watercolor painting. This really isn't great for low light, especially with the camera already pushing up the ISO to compensate for the lack of optical image stabilization. The 60 megapixel front camera takes some decent looking selfies too, but suffers the same image processing. The footage from video recording looks just about average. Stabilization at 1080p is decent, but at 4K, it's pretty much non existent. Hopefully, a software update will fix that. It's still a decent shooter overall, especially when you're just viewing them on your phone. You also get a bit more reach with the second camera. Just try not to crop or zoom in too much, and you won't really notice the image processing. It's just a bit strange that the OnePlus 3T actually performed better in this aspect. In the end, you get what you pay for. So, is the OnePlus 5 still worth buying? For the most part, yes. The performance and software experience is pretty much top of the pack. The design is decent, the battery life is good, and for frequent travellers, it has the added advantage of supporting a lot of LTE bands. But it still has some shortcomings. There is no water resistance, which is a standard feature for flagship devices. The speaker is very loud, but sounds very tinny. The display is not quite as brilliant as its competitors, and the camera is somewhat underwhelming. Then you have other concerns like the after-sales support and the broken promises regarding software updates in the past. This is largely the same formula as the OnePlus 3T, cutting some corners to keep the price low. Only this time round, the company is charging a bit more for the OnePlus 5, and the main selling point of the phone doesn't quite hit the mark. I do think that the OnePlus 5 is still a pretty good phone at this price, but with so many great flagship devices from other manufacturers this year, it's no longer an easy recommend like the OnePlus 3 was, especially when a lot of other flagship devices have gone down in price. Thanks for watching my review of the OnePlus 5. Do you feel the same way I do about the phone, or is it just me? I would love to hear from you guys. Of course, be sure to subscribe to my channel. Thanks, and see you guys on the next one.